I'm going to start by saying that, uh, to give a, a kind of a disclaimer at the very, very start to say that um, I am just one of many people who have been involved in this particular report um, that we've done for the last number of years. Um, the data, this work was started back in 2022 and we collected the data over Christmas and into the new year. Um, and we have now the, the results from, from that data that we're sharing here today. Um, this is kind of a preview of what will be the final report, but I'm very keen for um, folks here to give us feedback about what they found interesting, to make sure that we get the key points right and that they're clear. Um, and so I'm really, really interested to hear um, everything that you might have, uh, feedback that you may have for us, the entire team, or on particularly on this report, but also thinking about next year and how we may want to actually change it in the future as well. So you can keep all that in your head as I'm going through um, these, these few slides slides here today. Um, so first of all, my name is Claire. Um, I am the Executive Director in InnerSource Commons, but I'm also involved in the um, marketing working group, the marketing and outreach working group, which is where the, the, the actual um, survey work is done. It's, it's a sub working group within our marketing and working, outreach working group. Um, and so, so there's some great folks in there that actually help with this. So most of you, because you're here, will probably be familiar with Inner Source Commons. But for those of you who may be finding this on the internet after the fact, um, we are a community of Inner Source practitioners, over 2,000 individuals who have been involved in this from, from the beginnings of the community back in 2015 and over 750 organizations. Um, and it's been a community that's been growing quite significantly over the last number of years. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we are able to see what's happening within our community so we can assess what what the priorities are for the community moving forward when we think about all the resources and activities that we may want to create to actually help the community move forward. So let's have a little look, first of all, about some of the demographics of who was involved in responding to the survey. We had 112 respondents um, and about 84 after we deduped some of those and took away some of the folks that only answered a couple of the questions. There was around about 84 responses for most of the questions. So um, that was uh, it, 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 there were some that had fewer than others, some that had more than others. But for the vast majority of the main body of the questionnaire, we had about 84 responses. I will note at this point in time that this probably can be considered um, a survey and a, a report that is very relevant to the inner source commons community. So we're very conscious that um, the vast majority of respondents are very likely to come from the community. And um, that would imply that they're already interested in inner source. Um, and so therefore you have to uh, take the fact that some of these re results are, I suppose, particular to folks who are already started their inner source journey, know what it is and are part of the commons. Though we do have some folks that are outside the, the community who respond, the vast majority would be part of the, of the community. It's not surprising to learn that mostly um, the respondents were all male. I think that's a factor of our industry and uh, in particular the tech industry. Um, but uh, but that, that is a, a, just to be clear about that. Um, we do have a lot of very experienced people who responded. So the majority of folks who came and took the survey were over, had over 10 years experience in the industry. Um, there was a very wide spread of roles, so this is interesting. It wasn't just developers, um, but we also had project managers, advocates, and even some executives and service providers who were part of the folks that responded to this. Um, this was actually a piece of feedback that we took um, as part of the verbatims within the survey as well. Um, and we can talk about this later, but um, you know, one of the things that that I think we we need to take into the future, into 2024, is looking at perhaps some different questions that may actually apply to folks with different types of roles within organizations. There were also quite a widespread of the sectors who responded to the survey. We had 10 plus different sectors represented, re represented, but the majority of those, almost half, were from the tech industry. Um, so um, that again is worthwhile noting. Inner source certainly from our experience has spread throughout many, many different sectors and is popular across all of them. But the folks certainly who are at least participating in inner source commons and responding, um, as I said, nearly half of them were from the tech industry. It was spread across all org sizes, but uh, if you look at the actual spread across the org sizes, it was very heavily weighted towards the very large organizations. So 39% of those respondents uh, came from organizations with over 50,000 employees. Again, um, as, is, as we've witnessed with um, the participation in many of the inner source commons events and activities, it came, respondents came from all sorts of places all over the world. So there were 18 uh, plus countries or geographies listed. Um, the largest number of responses came from Germany and the United States. 
Um, I do want to note, because it came up in some of our analysis, we did allow for multiple respondents from an individual organisation, so we didn't uh, dedupe for that. Uh, there was some discussion as to whether or not that might skew the data, um, but just to let folks know that even in the context of having multiple respondents from uh, an individual organisation, uh, many times they were actually different legal entities within that organisation when we looked into the data. And also, what was really interesting was that when we did look at respondents from organisations organizations that were related, like, for example, maybe had the same similar parent company, but perhaps were different legal organizations, the responses were very different. So um, what we realized was that there was no real skewing of the data, even if there were multiple responses from one organization, um, parent organization. So that's just to note that, that we did allow for multiple responses from um, each organization. Um, one of the first things that I want to talk about is basically what uh, one of the questions was, what does inner source mean to you? Because this question about how we consider inner source, how do we define inner source is a question that has been coming up recently within the organization. Um, and I think what's really interesting is that there did seem to be fairly consistent uh, perceptions related to inner source. The predominant one was the idea of op adopting open source practices, which we're very glad to see, because that's, of course, at the heart of what inner source is. Um, but also thinking about things like code reuse, ena enabling collaboration, and very importantly, connecting and learning. And we'll see this crop up again in terms of the motivations and benefits of, um, of inner source. But the idea of creating networks across the organization and learning from others um, is, is, is a key common topic that, that kind of came up throughout the organization. Um, Again, you can see here that that those were the top, certainly, uh, uh, ideas or concepts in terms of what inner source means to the respondents. So having a look at now the status of where organizations are at with their inner source journey. Well, first of all, we had a little bit of, um, we had a few questions about people's experience levels with inner source, the origins of their inner source practice, um, how much support and resources that are available within their organizations and the programs they may have rolled out. So first of all, for the respondents, um, just over a quarter of them had one to three years experience. So they were, you know, I suppose, relatively early in their experience and over half of them had three plus years. So they were further along in terms of their, their inner source experience. What was interesting was we asked the question as to how did inner source originate in their organization? Um, the the almost 40% said that it was bottom up. So individual developers making change, change agents. We, we, we know lots of those folks um, in, in, the, in the community. So that was great to see. 15% uh, said that it was top down. So came from management as being a strategy that they wanted to implement within their organization. Um, but again, another 40% were like kind of mixed. So um, some of these uh, percentages don't add to 100. I will, I will state that here because oftentimes we offered the option for don't know or other or something like that. So um, sometimes that doesn't necessarily uh, correlate. But just to know that 40% uh, approximately were bottom up, 15% top down and 39% were mixed in that respect. In terms of whether or not this is seen to be a strategic uh, executive initiative, 68% reported that inner source is considered to be strategically important within their organizations and 65% have explicit executive management support in terms of their efforts. So that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty high. Um, and certainly if you think about that coming from a bottom up effort, um, a huge success for the folks in those organizations that they have managed to win that executive support. 43% um, though had dedicated inner source people. So we're still seeing a lot of organizations who are working on inner source practices, who are working in that inner source way, but they do not necessarily have dedicated people helping the rollout. Um, but we are seeing a growth in terms of how many how many folks have inner source programs or even inner source program offices. So 42% have informal inner source programs and 36% had formal programs or ISPOs. Um, and it, to the best of my knowledge, that's an increase in last year that we haven't gone, we haven't done any kind of um, uh, explicit uh, analysis yet in terms of trends from last year, but this is one that we will look at. Certainly it's been our experience in the community that we're seeing more and more organizations have formal inner source program offices or programs that they're rolling out within OSPOs. So so then we asked for, the, I think for the first time this year, what the trajectory of inner source is in your organization. And what we're seeing is that um, the vast majority of respondents were in that scaling up phase. So when we take the idea of uh, people scaling up or being post pilot and now scaling their efforts, um, uh, then that totaled to about 64%. About 18% were, were um, talking about being in the pilot phase. 
Um, and then I, I kind of we explicitly want to call out that uh, only 2% were saying that they were in an organization where inner source has been cut at their organization or it's in a negative trend uh, where, where the activity may be declining. Um, so that's that's quite positive. I will note that this data, again, was from, uh, you know, the early part of this year. So perhaps hasn't been impacted in for more recent um, industry developments. But still, this would be a really good indication that people are seeing inner source as strategic growth area for for their organization. What are the most significant blockers or obstacles? This is always an interesting topic and one that all, that I think generates a lot of interest and, and certainly a lot of fodder for our community calls and what we actually would talk about. Um, so, but once again, and this is consistent again with previous years, the top reported blockers are number one, the time um, available for people to contribute to inner source projects. Um, the second one, and in fact, it comes in later as well, is the idea of management buy-in, but specifically the idea of middle management buy-in. So the, the folks that are actually the, the managers um, who, who may have direct contact with developers. And that also sometimes relates to the time available because when people are being time managed and things like that, it's it's those individuals that may be actually um, enabling or not their inner source practices. Um, and then the second one is, uh, the third one, I should say, is the idea of the lack of familiarity with inner source principles. So the blocker would be simply a, an area that we know uh, could be addressed through education or something like that. So now... I will move on to looking at some of the benefits that have been reported from, from and the motivations that have been reported from our inner source survey respondents. Um, so we asked about why do people pursue inner source? What was the motivation from their organization? Um, and again, the top motivations are interestingly knowledge sharing, removing silos and bottlenecks and code reuse um, or creating reusable software. So they came out uh, very clearly as the top motivations from organizations. I think what's particularly interesting about this list um, as people uh, identify why they're actually participating in InnerSource is that we all know that um, the, the one of the key principles around um, uh, InnerSource practices certainly some of the motivations of our most early contributors in the community was indeed a path to open source readiness. And we know as well that many of the organizations who are participating in inner source are uh, using it as a step to open source readiness. But I think what is clear from this graph is that now inner source has an even broader appeal now than, um, than it may have had in the past. So many folks even if they don't know they're on a path to open source readiness, um, are adopting inner source as a way to do knowledge sharing, to do education, to create um, uh, more collaborative organizations and reusable software. And it's those efficiencies um, that seem to be the primary drivers. So this year, again, for the first year, we linked the, the, the question of these motivations to whether people had experienced um, a measurable progress in these areas. And we asked with a similar list where people had actually seen measurable progress against goals in these areas. And as you can see, um, the top three topics interested or, or, or listed are map directly onto the top motivation. So if folks have specific strategic goals in the area of knowledge sharing, removing silos of code reuse, they were the areas that had a seen measurable progress. So that was really great to see that if folks have that motivation, then a lot of people are, are seeing measurable progress in this area. Now, we didn't ask whether or not they perceived progress and it wasn't measurable, but this was this was really good to say that folks are actually getting, you know, hard um, progress and results from their inner source practices. But of course, we know from inner source commons that not everything that's valuable can actually be measured. So we also asked in another part of the survey, um, what were the perceived benefits from folks who are actually participating in inner source on their teams? Um, and once again, knowledge sharing comes out first. But I think what was really interesting here was that networking and developer satisfaction and enjoyment uh, were coming up really high. Uh, almost half the respondents were saying that these, or 75% or in terms of sharing knowledge, but even in terms of increased enjoyment, almost half of the respondents said that this was a key perceived benefit of inner source, which is great because we all want to be have happier developers everywhere. And um, that's obviously one of the one of the key uh, benefits we talk about with inner source. So it's great that people are perceiving that as a benefit as well. 
Um, so next we look at what are folks actually, how are they actually practicing inner source? What kinds of things are, are happening within their organization as they roll out their inner source practices? Uh, and we looked at these aspects of inner source readiness that have been taken from the inner source checklist. That's one of the books available as a, as a resources on our website. Um, and what we can see is that uh, right now we can see that, you know, 80% of respondents said that that code is, is stored in a version control repository. So they've got formalized or standardized ways to actually share that code. Um, there is 61% said that the project they're working on is being used or consumed by other teams. So that'd be the code reuse um, uh, idea. 44% uh, that said that the code was sufficiently modular for others to understand. So we're getting up to 44%. That's pretty good. Maybe some room for improvement. Um, one area that I would see is perhaps a little bit maybe uh, a challenge would be that only 43% say that the code is sufficiently well documented. And we know that, for example, great documentation is a key, um, I suppose, element in making successful inner source programs. Uh, so that would be perhaps Perhaps we can discuss it later, but this might be seen to be perhaps on the low side. And um, we would hope that inner source folks that are um, uh, participating in inner source practices would put a heavy emphasis on documentation because we know it's such a key driver to successful inner source projects. Um, and 35% had dedicated trusted committers uh, who handle guest contributions for people outside their team. And then if you're looking at the kinds of you know, I suppose, behaviors that you were seeing within the team. Uh, what I can say here is that um, pretty high, upwards of 60%, uh, are some of the behaviors that we know that are, I'll describe perhaps as a little bit more passive inner source behaviors. So for example, people being comfortable seeing their code and that it's less than perfect, that has been a blocker in the past. So it's great to see that that is, is, is becoming a, a more acceptable practice. Um, the fact that, that team members are willing to do code reviews from guest contributors, that's great news. Um, that they're willing to participate in forums and answer questions, that's fantastic. That they will respond to bugs and are open to mentoring. Um, again, we're getting a little bit lower, just over half now are open to mentoring. Um, we are seeing that a lot of folks, well, over half are actually participating in open source projects, which I would say is a higher percentage than developer populations as a whole. So that's probably an um, indication that there's a lot of folks that have already got some experience in open source that are participating in the inner source projects. Um, and that the 54% are open to receiving less than perfect code contributions, which is good news because sometimes uh, if you set the bar too high, you mightn't get so many good contributions. So that's all good. Um, but then we drop down to lower than 50% when we get to things that probably are a little bit more proactive in terms of um, inner source um, practices, things like having difficult conversations with guest contributors about accepting or rejecting contributions, um, things like having a, a recorded or archival mechanism for discussions so that, you know, people can see the background, the history. This has come up again as a great best practice from some of our, our community members, but only 32% of folks have that um, in play. Um, and indeed, only 31% are active refactoring or modularizing code to make it easier for folks to contribute to that code base. So for me, this is probably an indication, something along the lines of what is perhaps easier to either passively engage in or reactively respond to. You know, we're getting really good responses on those. But as we go down towards more proactive um, activity or, for example, difficult conversations, then perhaps there's a little bit less uh, um, of those practices happening uh, on a regular basis. So, again, something for us to explore. What does this you know, mean? What, how can we improve these um, uh, areas would be something that I'm sure the community will be discussing in detail over the next uh, while. When we looked at what how code was being made visible or discoverable within organizations, we can say that 57% uh, of folks said that code is visible to everyone within the organization and 14% that said it was visible, but only upon request. So there are some organizations that are putting in a uh, gates um, in terms of that, those inner source practices. And that is something that we've seen uh, uh, happen in, in various different folks participating in the community. And indeed, when it comes to being able to register or advertise projects, perhaps, perhaps for example, in a, in a portal, 49% uh, said yes, 36% said no, and 15% didn't know, or there was another uh, alternative mechanism in place. So um, again, only about half 
half of the organizations have this formal way of registering or advertising projects. So I think, um, you know, this certainly says to me that perhaps it would be really interesting to find out a little bit more about those organizations that have not, um, that are attempting to scale, but perhaps have not got some sort of formal way of actually uh, promoting the projects to see what they may be doing as, as an alternative. So then again, looking at how it works within organizations, um, 63% of those that responded said that their product had accepted contributions from outside their team. Um, the majority of respondents, again, round about the same amount, 67% reported that some team members are experienced in accepting guest contributions, uh, but only 20% responded that all team members have that experience. So that would indicate to me that folks, there are particular people being nominated within teams to accept those guest contributions, but perhaps even within inner source practices, it may not be a widespread um, uh, that it's that, that, that the accepting of guest contributions or that role is, for example, a universal one. Um, again, be really interesting to hear people's feedback about that here on the call today. A common trend, you've seen it before in the blockers in this report, but this is happening um, again and again, is that not enough time is perceived to be allocated to individuals to be able to do inner source contributions. So 70% of those in of respondents reported that only some or very few individuals are afforded the time for inner source contributions. So this is not, it's not universally, for example, supported that everyone would be allowed to, to or given the time, I should say, to make those inner source contributions. So that um that that would that would um, uh, align with the response that block time is one of the biggest blockers to successful inner source uh, adoptions. It does seem too that when it comes to what people can choose to work on, then only some or few people have the choice of which projects to work on. So over half of the organizations or the respondents, I should say, said that, um, that only some or few people have that choice about which projects they want to work on. Um, and only 26, so just, just above a quarter of respondents reported that all or most individuals have that choice. So the majority of folks um, are not necessarily being given free reign as to what they may want to participate in. Um, only, as I said, just above a quarter of, the, of those respondents have that ability within an organization. Um, there's been a lot of discussion here in the community about how do we link the idea of incentivizing inner source contributions and participation in that community with uh, rewards and career progression. Uh, but, but, but to date, only, again, just slightly above a quarter of respondents say that their organizations reward those who make contributions, so there may not be any formal incentivization program in place. And over half, 51%, do not um, uh, reward people who make contributions. So one would assume then that the, the only incentives for those uh, organizations and for those individuals contributing may be from a social perspective, but there's certainly no formal program in place. And very few organizations, only 12% have specifically defined uh, criteria that are related to uh, inner source contributions that are linked to career advancements and pr promotions. So we know some organizations who've come and shared their experience and community calls about how this is being formally adopted within organizations, but we can see from this data that that's only a very small number of the overall community that are actively linking um, inner source success to rewards and promotions and career um, progression. Um, so that's that's the summary of the results. It is not the full details we had uh, in, in total 40 questions. Um, I don't have time to go into detail in all of those. And uh, we will be fleshing those out in the final report. Um, but before we go into the discussion, I just want to say a huge thank you to the team of folks who have worked on this um, for the last number of months. Um, everyone who was involved in the creation of the survey, the discussions about how to improve it, um, the promotion of it within our community, um, and indeed the analysis of the, the results and those who may in the future be interested in helping us write up and, and um, comment more on these results. If you are interested in that work, please do reach out and join us within this team. Um, it's a group of folks who um, uh, we would love to have your contributions and we would be very welcoming to anyone who, to, who would like to get involved in, in helping out on that report. Um, so without, uh, because we all know that Inner Source Commons is all about the people. So I just wanted to say, if you haven't already signed up and joined us, uh, please do so at innersourcecommons.org. And uh, indeed, if you come onto the Slack channel, just reach out to me or any of the other folks in the hashtag survey channel, uh, we'd be delighted to see you there. 